Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we continue in our study in the book of Judges, as we look for further symbols, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his blessing and his guidance so that we may more properly understand that, that he would have us to know at this earth's time. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, there is much yet that we need to understand. There are many things that we need to be able to consider. We turn to you. For you are the one that provides true knowledge, true science, true guidance. You are our creator, our judge, our friend, our God. Direct us today in this study. Help us <clears throat> to understand that which we need to know for this time in Earth's history. Please bless us. Please direct us. Please show us that that you would have us to do. You are Lord. We need you. We need your spirit. Because only through your spirit may we understand things correctly. Help us. May your angels attend us. May your will be done in our lives. Now and always. For this we ask. For this we pray. And this we thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so Theodore, you have before you a document that you were sent by Florin. So if you would please um, introduce this and give us some background. Yeah, so um, Florin, <clears throat> if you remember, he's the one who had done some diagrams on uh, Ezekiel on the temple and uh, when we were studying the book of Ezekiel. So he, he sends me things once in a while. And, and I think here what he has to say um, is something that we can examine and it should help us a little bit in sorting through um, well not just the riddle of Judges 14 14 but also um, uh, just this this issue with Samson himself and I don't agree with everything he says here that there are there are a few points that I think um, we have to well we need to consider all of what he says I guess um, even if I disagree with it. So he says, uh, from Samson's riddle from Judges 14.14, 14, he says he personally believes that it refers to the line of the tribe of Judah that was killed by the nation of Israel, from which sweetness honey came out from the rock. So he's saying that if this line represents Christ, that when Samson kills this lion, this would represent the nation of Israel crucifying Christ. Does that make sense to people? How, how could we justify that? Yeah, it makes sense to me in the sense that the lion was torn in pieces by Samson. And in Psalm 22, Christ was saying, all my bones are out of joint and so forth. So his body was definitely broken for us. So yes. I can see that, yeah, the lion can be Christ, can represent Christ. Now, his, the reason that he came to this conclusion, I wouldn't have come to this conclusion based upon this, but, um, you know, it probably was just a key that kind of opened up his thinking, um, which, which was uh, the amazement of the disciples in the upper room on Resurrection Sunday when they saw Jesus who ate... Um, ate over roast and honey so that must be a translation so he had a roasted fish a broiled fish and a honeycomb if you remember there in luke 24 44. Right. Um, and so then he he said these words are the words i told you now 
I don't know how it would be unrelated. So if we if we look at that verse, so I don't quite understand his reasoning here, but it could be a language barrier because he uses translation. Um, so this is um, here. I'm just going to switch screens here. Go to my Bible program. So Luke 24, when Jesus appears to his disciples, and, and this is going to be after the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, right? So he's going to now be in the upper room. And he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Which refers to food, not just animal flesh, but anyway. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, um, I don't see that how this is unrelated, um, unless you say that what he says is unrelated to um, him asking for broiled fish and a an honeycomb. I mean, I think what he's he's showing is that he's actually resurrected. And this is what he had told them. So to me, it seems directly related. The fact that he's demonstrated he's a human being, not, not some kind of spirit. So, um, so from that, he had drawn this conclusion. So if we go back there. Any thoughts on this verse, though, first, before we leave it? I'm just current. I'm currently taking this in. I don't really have anything. Okay. Yet. But yeah. So as far as this passage, though, I mean, it seems pretty clear that he's answering the question about why they're frightened. And so eating the fish and the honeycomb is related. It's not. Like, this is not unrelated. Everything that happens to me seems to flow logically. But they're, they are frightened because of a lack of faith. Yeah. Yeah. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to say to them, have faith. Don't hold on to the unbelief that's in your heart have faith in what you're seeing before you. Yeah. And then, so the words that he told them is that he was going to be resurrected. Right. So he's just demonstrated that he has been resurrected. So the words in Luke 24, 44 are, are not unrelated to what he just did. So that's what I don't understand in his reasoning when he says these words, uh, you know, what he says here in Luke 24, 44 seems to be, is to them seemingly unrelated that what he says to them. So, um, but I don't see it that way. So, so I don't understand that, but I do see um, uh, that we know that the honey is a symbol and it's a symbol of affliction, like in, the, in Isaiah chapter 7, when it says, butter and honey shall he eat. The idea of the butter and honey is butter and honey would what, what would be available to eat in the time when the land is deep. So if you have um, a captivity, you're still going to have animals around from which you can get milk, and you're still going to have access to honey. You just won't have access to a lot of other things. Um, so it becomes a symbol in Hebrew, um, in the Bible, for the affliction that happens as a result of a captivity. So, so honey represents 
that at least. We know it also represents the Holy Spirit, especially when it comes to um, opening our eyes, right? So that we're, our eyes are enlightened. Now, as far as the fish, though, because this isn't a roast, um, this isn't a, 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 a mammal. I mean, this is a, a fish that he's going to eat, a broiled fish and some honey. Um, now, we know, of course, uh, um, you know, the fish representing Christ because uh, of uh, the name of Jesus um, we can we can take the I can't remember how we do it, but we take the letters and it can represent a fish in Greek. And so the fish has become a symbol of Christ, but I don't know if that's really what's happening here as far as a symbol. So so as far as that, I, I don't know how the fish symbolize anything, but I can see the honey symbolizing something. So the fish must. Um, so he came to this conclusion regarding the line of the tribe of Judah. But I, I would think that you wouldn't really need this uh, to come to that conclusion. Now, then he says, uh, Samson is first a symbol for the Jews. And, and I would agree with that. But then he says, then for the papacy, which I can't agree with. Uh, why would we not have Samson symbolizing the papacy? Because the papacy was not being part of God's people. Right. The line, the line here, I mean, Samson first being a symbol for the Jews. If, if you're going to take this in a logical progression, you would go Jews, either Protestants or Millerites, and then the SDA. Yeah, so the papacy, the papacy is not God's people. God's people are persecuted by the papacy. And, and first, you know, they're going to be persecuted by a pagan Rome and then papal Rome. Um, so the Jews are going to be persecuted, and then Christians, of course. Um, so I, I don't see how we could have the papacy here. We can't have a symbol that represents Christ or the church or the 144,000 ever being applied to the papacy. Right. And then, <clears throat> this is the type of thing where people will say, well, the Adventist church is Babylon. It never can be. It can be in Babylonian captivity but it can never be Babylon. Here again, you have the Jews rejecting <clears throat> the message of righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. You have the same thing that had occurred with both the, the Protestants and then within the corporate church. The message of righteousness by faith is an anathema to the, to the papacy because their entire message is righteousness by works. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so I, I don't see how we could have the papacy in there. Now, as far as for the Jews, this would be now, the Jews. Samson was sent to, yeah, sorry, Theodore. Samson was sent to free the people. The, the, the papacy wants to enslave us all. Yeah, what, what we just see is that Samson is, is set aside for this purpose, but he, he fails in his purpose Well, until the end. Okay, but in this, in this situation, The papacy is more properly represented by the Philistines. Yes. Yeah. So the Philistines can represent the papacy. Okay. But, but now, definitely Samson cannot. As we continue in this study, we're going to be seeing that <clears throat> the message that Samson had come to give 
was largely understood by the Jews, specifically by the Jews of the tribe of Judah. Now, in this situation here, Samson being first a symbol of the Jews, fine. I agree with you, no on the papacy. I have no issue with it pro progressing to the corporate church and to some of the movement. And I don't have an I, I don't have a whole a lot of heartburn with the symbol for the 144,000 being represented by Samuel. I, I would say Samuel, Elijah, and then Elisha, Noah, Daniel, and Job, and Ezekiel. Those don't really bother me. Yeah. So so I would say that, you know, Samson is um, a symbol for the 144,000. So he, he tries to say, but the symbol for the 144,000 is rather Samuel. Well, I don't see how Samson would be excluded from this list because as all the signs of the 144,000. And, and specifically this movement, which is about the 144,000. So if you say for some of this movement, you can't take it, you can't take the 144,000 out of there. Unless it's just an English problem. But well, uh, okay, I would I would ask it in this way. Would you would you think Samson being a representation of the 144,000, or is it more correct to look at this as Samson being one? that has heard the message, but is laid to rest before the final test? Well, I would say that he represents those that pass the final test in the end. Okay. So I wouldn't say his death represents like those that have died or anything. Um, he is ultimately victorious. But we, we see, you know, and I, Excuse me, I point this out, you know, with Manasseh being a type of Christ. And and we have these these types. Um, so often people just think a type of Christ has to be something good. But there are certain things that are being illustrated here. And what's being illustrated in Samson is God's people and their failures, but ultimately their victory. Because we see that with the Jews. I mean, we, we don't see that the Jews, they're chosen by God, but are they victorious all the way through? Do they have, you know, con are they constantly faithful to God? No. So, so Samson is illustrating that. He's illustrating God's people. And that would have to be God's people of all time. You know, so the Jews in in their literal sense, but also in their symbolic sense. Could uh, Samson be representing the Christian church from the time of John the Baptist? Because we have a sort of similar situation. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist and his parents and uh, mm -hmm. like a miraculous child in a sense there and the sort of yeah. like a Nazarite connection. And yeah. then... Uh, so at the end, we have Laodicea at the end. So again, Samson's blind. And he's between two pillars and he brings the pillars down, maybe connecting that to the, the two pillars, maybe connect to some Ellen White comment. Uh, have to think. Uh, maybe the Sabbath there or something. And well, well, we can see that it, from a pagan temple. I mean, that would be Sunday sacredness and... and uh, um the immortality it, it, of the soul yeah the immortal soul right so those then end up being taken down and and yeah so so we definitely can take it put samson in the as illustrating the time of christ but we could also have samson illustrating god's people in general prior to that just because it their history is really the same they killed the prophets but ultimately, they do kill Christ. They kill the Son. And I, I would think that that would be the main application that we would make if we're going to look at it historically of what Samson is, is illustrating. 
But we know that that history is always repeated. So when, when we're looking at a line, a line, when we make an application to one line, it doesn't discount an application to another line because each line is the same. They all illustrate the same thing. So this killing of the line of the tribe of Judah, it is the line of the tribe of Judah who opens up prophecy. Correct? Agreed. And, and specifically, these are going to be, you know, the prophecy uh, like of, of, the, of the, that little book, right? That book, that scroll in um, Revelation chapter 5. But he's also going to be a lamb slain with seven horns and seven eyes. So, so we have these symbols of Christ um, that are used here in the story of Samson. And remember, when you open the little book and you eat it, what does it taste like? Honey. Right. So if we're going to look at this lion, which has honey, honeycomb in it with honey, uh, I mean, that would be prophecy, would it not? It would need to be. But, but these are specifically prophecies about Christ. So we know that this, um, when it tears, when, when Samson, you know, tears this line to pieces, I mean, that can definitely represent the cross of Christ and the Jews calling for the death of Christ. But it's also a rejection of prophecy. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, well, with the Millerites, you had that honey in, at the end of a prophecy of Islam in 1840. Mm -hmm. So you have like a 391 years there coming yeah. to the ending at that point, which brings that honey. Now, if you count, out, count up uh, the number of people that uh, Samson killed, so you have there initially the 30. Yeah. I think there's 30 people he kills, and then there's a thousand. Yeah. Yeah, with a jawbone of an ass. Jawbone. Bam. Yeah. And then he, at the end, with them pillars, they bring him down in the Temple of Dagon, he kills 3,000. So if you add them up, it's four, four, 400,030. Okay. So that, that is 10 times the number of years and lunar years of which is 391 years. Okay. So you're saying it's, yeah, so it's 4,003. What's the number? So he did, he killed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so he, he four, 4,030. Yeah. So, so 4, we have 403. Yeah. Lunar years. It's 391 okay. years. So I'll show you what Stephen's talking about here. Um, cause this might, some people might not refer to, um, understand this. So I'm just going to go to the calculator here. So it's just really simple. He's going to kill those 30 people for their garments, right? Plus he's going to kill a thousand with the jawbone of an ass. And then he's going to kill 3000 when he takes down the pillars, right? Mm -hmm. And so we All have right. this number. Now, what, what most people don't know is that this number 403, if you go 391 years. That's 4,030. Yes, but I'm taking the 403 from it, oh. one-tenth. So the 390 years of the prophecy of Islam, that many months is, um, uh, is um, well, I'll do it this way. I'll go 391 times... Uh, uh, how did I do that? Oh, 391 times 12. Will that make it here? So this is the number of, of months on our calendar, right? 391 years has this many months. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably confuse people with this. But if I take this many months and I look at the number of days, or here's a better way of doing it. 
it's it's 11,900 days. It's a little bit more than that. 11,900 days is 391 months on on our calendar. But on the Islamic calendar, it's 403 months. So if I divided this by 403, I will get the length of a month. It's 29 point, it's, it's not exact here, so. So what Stephen is saying is that Islam is represented here, the prophecy of the 391 years and 15 days is being represented by the number of people that Samson killed. Does that make, is that a good explanation, Stephen, or is there a better way of explaining that? Oh, that's fine. Okay. That's Anybody okay. have questions? I, I didn't do a very good job in my view, but because um, it's just, it's going to be too much math for people. So what we have is we have this symbol of the number of people that was killed, and that is going to represent the prophecy of Islam. So when we're going to make an application then to our history, because you're saying that we have this opened up, prophecy is opened up with that prophecy of Islam, right? The year yes. Day, yeah, the year day principle. There's a whole bunch that opens up because of that prophecy. Now, in our history, um, we have the opening up of prophecy as well. And we use honey as a symbol of that, right? It's the eating of the little book, which is going to be, um, and if we go to that, that's Revelation. And 10. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go there. I'll just show it on my screen. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Now, we also have something similar in Ezekiel. Um, it's Ezekiel 20, is it Ezekiel? Where is that in Ezekiel? Yeah, chapter 3. Yeah, just um, another point without Revelation. Revelation yeah. 10, you have uh, the seven thunders as a lion roar as well. So you have that connection of honey and a lion. Yes, right. And we know that the seven thunders are sealed up, but they also are still unsealed by the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right, in our history. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And then he has to give this message, which, of course, that's the bitter part of it. Right, the disappointment and so forth that that comes. The rejection of that message is one of it, one of the things about giving uh, the message. So, um, I mean, there's a lot more connections that we could go through here. But we can see then that this, um, this idea uh, that we have this honey uh, does connect us to the lion in prophecy. So, so we can say that it represents Christ in his crucifixion, but remember Christ's crucifixion um, seals up all vision and prophecy, according to Daniel chapter nine, uh, verse 24, right? And any thoughts on that? How this represents Christ's crucifixion plus prophecy in our history and what, what would that mean in our history
So when it comes to the persecution of God's people, is that not typified by what happened to Christ? Yes. Because Christ says they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. When God's, when God's people give a message and it's rejected by the church, is that not analogous with uh, the Jews rejecting Christ and crucifying him? Yes. So I think we always need to, yeah, I think we always need to be very, very careful when somebody gives a message, even if we initially react to it negatively, to actually consider it that it could be from God. Uh, and, and especially if we are involved in in attacking a message by not addressing the points of a message, but by attacking the people themselves. We are, we are doing a work that is not the work of Christ. And we can all agree on that. Well, when we, when we go back through what's been happening within this movement post July 18th, mm -hmm. we haven't had people so much attacking the message as they have been attacking the people. Yeah. And that's why it's so important that when somebody says something, now the thing is some people will feel that when you disagree with what someone's saying and you bring forth your arguments that you are attacking a person but they have a wrong conception of what attacking a person is disagreeing with a person is not an attack but misrepresenting their character uh, accusing them falsely um, taking what they say out of context and twisting it creating a straw man argument um, trying to dissuade other people from listening to uh, what that person has to say. All, all of these things are an attack, but disagreeing, having a difference of understanding and taking the time to follow Ellen White's counsel in sitting down and, and creating this opportunity to listen are not an attack of, an, of a person. Asking a person a question to try to get to the point of what it is they're presenting is not an attack. But often we take it as an attack when somebody that we agree with is disagreed with. And we take it, well, that person must be attacking them. And so we have to make this distinction of what an attack is. What, what, what does it mean to persecute someone? Uh, you know, when when we got uh, kicked off of WhatsApp, I mean, that was a type of censure, right? Correct. And and it's also not allowing other people to to listen to what's being said and to draw their own conclusions. And and you can do that sort of in a you know like take somebody off, but you can also do a defense facto type of censure by every time that somebody says something uh, you accuse him falsely and uh, and then you know gossip and spread rumors so that people won't listen to him and that's another type of censor so we can censor people in different ways but that's why we need to examine all that's being said. <clears throat> now, just this last part of this, um, I don't, I, I don't quite understand where he's coming from here. He says we cannot be totally objective with typological applications if we do not yet recognize the fulfillment of every vision. Um, now, I don't know if that's true because I don't know if we're ever going to understand the fulfillment of every vision. Um, and I, I don't know what that has to do with objectivity. Um, we're, we're continually are bringing lines in to help us look at things more clearly as, as we've been going through this history. But I don't, I don't know if we could ever look at every single application because there's, there's almost an infinite number of uh, typological applications they can apply on 
a local level, an individual. They can apply in different times and um, they can be zoomed in and they can be expanded out. Um, and then he says, I also believe that the papacy comes from the tribe of Dan, obviously symbolically. And why would that not be correct? How would the judge of God's people be represented as the papacy? Yeah. And that, the papacy that's the question that comes to my mind. And the papacy is outside of God's people. It Correct. isn't God's people. It's not, it's not God's people gone bad. It's paganism, paganism dressing up as if it's Christianity. Right. Now, Dan represents... A, a, an aspect of our character that is excluded from heaven. And that is the aspect of the character that is most closely associated with the accuser of the brethren. That is the backbiter, right? Correct. Criticizing and judging our brethren instead of taking the time to study things out. So, uh, and I think we have to make it really clear, this distinction between what the papacy represents, what Babylon represents, and what uh, God's people, Jerusalem, represent. And they definitely are not, they're not compatible symbols. They, they, you can never apply a symbol of the papacy as being fulfilled by God's people. God's people are never Babylon. They can be in Babylonian captivity, and I think that's where people get confused about it. But they're captive, and it's God's people that are captive. They don't ever captive, you know, make themselves captive to themselves in that sense. So, um, yeah, papacy wants to chain up God's word and make it uh, inaccessible. Yeah, inaccessible. Yeah. So, so God's people have failed. But God's people are never Babylon. They can be worse than Babylon because they have greater light and they reject that light. And, and this is one of the problems that I had with uh, Tabo and Parminder was the idea that, you know, the church was, they didn't say the church was Babylon, but it didn't really matter because they were acting as if the church was Babylon. And that the idea that they were going to start a new church. And, and that's not what God does. Right? Ellen White's quite clear on that, that there's never another calling out. We don't call people out of Adventism. Now, people can be in Babylonian captivity and be Adventists. And in that sense, we can call them out of Babylon. But we are to call them to God's church and not to some new church that's formed. We're just a, re a reformation, a revival and a reformation is calling God's people to truly be Seventh-day Adventists, not some new movement that has some new name. So anyway, any other thoughts on this before we go back to uh, Judges chapter 14 itself? I think that uh, Florin raises some interesting points, but I would have to say that there are definitely some some issues with some of the things that that he is saying. Yeah. So, and and I think these points. The main point here would be that this can represent the crucifixion of Christ, the rejection of Christ by the Jews, and then Stephen puts it in a really good context with, um, uh, which we had sort of done already, but the idea of that. This is this birth that is analogous to the birth of Christ. So Samson's birth and, of course, Manasseh's birth and Christ's birth are all connected with some of the same symbols. Okay, so you can share your screen there, Dwight. Okay.
Okay. Now, <clears throat> as we were addressing yesterday, we have the riddle. We've just gone over Florin's thoughts about this with the riddle. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if you can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out. Then I will give you 30 sheets or 30 shirts and 30 change of garments. And we related this seven days of the feast to the seven days of Leah and the seven days of Raquel. Because we're seeing that in a marriage feast, that there were seven days that were set aside. And we have, and we have the seven-day feast in the book of Esther. And exactly. So these are giving us the literal explanations on this with the seven-day feast. What other symbolic representations do we see here? I'm just wondering, as that seven-day feast in Esther was followed by 180 years, sorry, 180 days. Preceded by. Yeah. Yes, sorry, yeah, preceded by. Uh, we had mentioned anyway in the time of Jephthah, uh, there was an 18 year period connected with the Philistines, so maybe it's a bit uh, too far off from it but to sort of bring it right. into this year time. But uh, I'm not too sure, just, tonight, just a thought. And just, just as you're just bringing up again, Stephen, here you have this 180 day time period preceding the seven day feast, but if we take it all as, as one long feast again we have the symbol for july 18th 187 days of feast yes so the symbols that are pointing toward july 18th continue to accumulate but we also have this these seven days divided into three days and four days. Right. Um, so why would that be? Would the four days be a representation of the messages of Revelation 14 and 18? Well, like the third angel's message, the three days, and then the four days representing the fourth? Or the, the four days representing the entire message? Well, I mean, that's possible, I guess. Um, but we know the three days come from that, that we, because we studied into detail, but we do have it in the, uh, the story of Ezra, uh, three periods of three days. And, um, we know that's a symbol that's going to come to the end of our line, December 25th, 2021. So if we took that, we could say that in three days, they still did not understand the riddle. That is, there's something about the prophecy of July 18th. And can we say that this riddle is the riddle of July 18th? I think that'd be a way of looking at it. Okay. So if it's not understood, there still is going to be four more days, which would represent, to me, the four days represent the repeat of history. or So it represents our movement. Um, so however we want to put it, whether we want to take each of the days, represent the different messages. Um, 
but our movement has not understood it, right? Because there isn't this understanding of the riddle because Samson didn't tell it to his father or his mother. But he's going to tell it to his, his wife, who, of course, is not going to really be his wife because he's, he's going to end up rejecting her. So, so we would have to make an application of this or try to understand how this applies uh, to this movement. We've got quite a bit yet to cover in this, so sorry, go ahead. Is the change of garment righteousness? Well, Samson is promising a change of raiment, but would that be to give righteous to give righteousness to the unrighteous? Yeah, because in this in this section here, so we know that um, uh, she wept before him the seven days while the, their feast lasted, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him, and she told and she told the riddle to the children of her people, and the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If he had not plowed with my heifer, he had not found out my riddle. And um, the commentators um, that I looked at regarding this part of it, um, yeah, so it says here um, that to plow one's heifer or to plow in another man's ground are delicate turns of expression used both by the Greeks and the Latins as well as the Hebrews to point out the wife's infidelities. Um, and so, uh, so she ends up, so if she's, if she's his wife, she's a wife that commits adultery, right? I, no disagreement with this. Yeah, even, even during this wedding feast. Well, okay. I'll put this out. I'll put this out to everyone that's here right now. How many brides do you know that have been weeping during their weddings? Well, for joy or sadness? Weeping. In, in this case would have to be weeping for sadness because she's expressing that she is not happy. She's not, she's not happy with what's going on because she's saying, you don't trust me enough to take me into your confidence. Yeah. But she's been unfaithful. Right. Now also uh, Stephen has brought up a point here that this plowing is line upon line. We've right. used that analogy in, in our movement. Um, but this is a counterfeit. Would we agree with that? Is it a counterfeit or is it a representation of the use of, under, uh, of, of a method of study that is not according to God's will? Yeah, that's, that's what I mean, a method of study not according to God's will. It's a counterfeit of what we do. With okay. Life. On that, I can agree with you. Yeah. So, Samson has presented this riddle. He's given a challenge. If you can decipher the riddle within seven days. Mm -hmm. then I'm going to give you 30 shirts and 30 changes of garments. 
but if you cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me 30 shirts and 30 changes of garments. So, and then they, they challenged him. They put forth, they said unto him, put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. So this is where I'm struggling with the idea that Samson is offering them righteousness because that would be the, the antithesis that we're seeing in Judges 14, 13 would be the Philistines offering Samson righteousness. Does that make sense? Sort of. I mean, these garments that, that Samson's going to, I mean, garments represent character whether it's righteous or unrighteous. So they don't, they don't necessarily have to be righteousness because all of our righteousness are as filthy rags and, and we have to take off our filthy garments and put on a change of raiment so that we're dressed in Christ's righteousness. That's the symbol that's used. Um, but what Samson's asking for, why he's asking for 30 changes of garment, I mean, why would he want 30 garments? Uh, people don't generally change all that often. Um, you know, uh, a good garment can be about a year's wages, something you would always wear. Um, to have more than one garment, you have to be very, very rich. So, um, So it's, why does he do this riddle in the first place? And why the 30 garments and 30 shirts? Well, he's providing a challenge. We understand that part. He's thinking that they're not going to be able to decipher the meaning And there's something prophetic that we're looking at here from Judges 14.14, 14, 14, because as we've said, numerically, this would be a type of a doubling. And if it's a doubling, we're dealing with something having to do with the second angel's message. So how can we interrelate the riddle to the second angel's message? Well, one of the things we would do here is we would recognize that the second angel's message, just like the first and the third, is about righteousness by faith. It's about changing garments, character. And, and this is the thing that Samson has not understood, is he has been set aside, he's separated with a Nazarite vow, but he doesn't have the character in order to, to fulfill that vow as it's meant to be fulfilled. And this would be like the church or even people within this movement or this movement in general, in that we, we want to have this garment, but this garment is not Christ's righteousness because he's not asking for Christ's righteousness in asking for those 30 changes of garment because these are Philistine garments that he's asking for. Right. See the... Is uh, the three days, um, like three years, we have not really understood July 18th, and maybe it's going to be explained? Well, we already had made an application of the three days. So... One of the things about our line, the 777 days, is we had three dates that fell on a Sabbath, November 9th, 2019, July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021. Now, the way that these line up with the biblical calendar, um, uh, Odilia had done some work on this. But it, it's the only time it ever occurs. That is to have those dates 
where the 26th day of the fourth month is July 18th, the middle date, and you actually have 777 cardinal days from November 19th to December 25th. So never before in history did that arrangement occur. And we take those three days then as symbolic of the three days in Ezra, that there's this call to come to Jerusalem within three days to separate from the strange wives. And the strange wives are going to represent the method of study. And so this movement on December 25th, 2021, was called to a method of study. And people were then to make their choice. Now, Stephen was given some insight regarding chronology on December 25th, 2021, regarding that there's 777 years from 457 BC uh, to 321 AD. Is that correct, Stephen? Is that the... Well, uh, yes, but sort of, it's not just that, it's connecting it to the Lamech, to the mm. Lamechs as well. Right. Yeah, so we're connecting it to the two Lamech, Lamechs. So that is, that is, you have the 70 times 7 and the 777 years, right? So you have 490 years and 777 years, and it ties that symbol to the Sunday law. And which is what um, we had understood that was being symbolized by December 25th, 2021. So, so the fact that we have these number of years, that was given to us on December 25th, 2021. So to me, that was a confirmation. And, and this is something we should have easily seen, right, Stephen? Wasn't it right in front of us the whole time? Yes. Okay. So, so we, we never did the calculation. We never did that. And, and that tied us to, um, to the Sunday law. And there's a bunch of other things connected to that as well. But the main idea here is that these three days, we are now being called since December 25th, 2021, to study the Bible correctly. And that's what we have been, been doing. But we had a confirmation with that, that understanding of that chronology that we were on the right track. So something that was right in front of our noses, we didn't notice until December 25th, 2021. We could have easily noticed it back in 2019, especially when Stephen and Odilio and I were in Arkansas on November 9th. We could have figured it out because we were dealing with some of these same ideas, same symbols, but nobody thought to count 777 years from 457 BC. So uh, does that help answer your question, Rosanna? No, I'm more confused. Okay, so the three years that you're talking about, we already had them marked from 2019 to 2021. Right? That is the three days. So those three days ended on the 20th day of the ninth month in Ezra chapter 10. They're called to separate from, they're called to come to repentance so that they can separate from their strange wives. So that's what this movement was called to on December 25th, 2021. We were to come to Jerusalem and repent and then what happened is there is set up this divorcement period <clears throat> that goes from the first day of the 10th month and that's completed on the first day of the first month so that is the time in which we are in in the story of ezra we are 
either divorcing from our false study of Scripture or we are digging in <coughs> and using Protestant methods and incorrect methods of study, which will lead us to false conclusions, which ultimately will result in what happened to many of the Adventists, the majority of the Adventists, after 1844. They rejected the midnight cry and fell off the path and went into darkness. And that's the danger that exists for people in this movement at the present time. So those three days, as you said, are three years, but those three years have expired. Right, they expired on December 25th, 2021. Does that help, Rosanna? Is this not future though? No. After July 18th? It, well, it's connected to July 18th. So July 18th has passed, and July 18th was part of that structure of the three days. So that was all about July 18th. December 25th, 2021 was about July 18th. Have you accepted July 18th and the method of study that led to July 18th? What if we go from July 18th, three years, into 2023? and receive the garment. Well, and, and that could be that we, we could do that and say that, that that period of divorcement, because we're in the period of divorcement, that is we're in that period that they had, they had three months, the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th month. And those also represent days, because we, we've shown that. Um, so those three months that they're doing this divorcement, could also be represented by three days. So at the end of those three days, uh, we come to April 5th, 2030. So, so the three days or the three months we've already shown, bring us to April 5th, 2030. So we could make an application there. And they and April 20, uh, April 15th, 2030 connects to uh, January 11th, 2023. So, so we could make an argument that the three days and the three months in the story of Ezra, there's that period between when the three days end and when the three months begin. And how many days is that from the 20th day of the ninth month to the first day of the 10th month? So they come and repent at Jerusalem, right? <clears throat> on the 20th day of the ninth month, and then they're going to commence the divorce on the first day of the 10th month. So how many days? You said the 20th day of the ninth month? Yeah to the first day of the 10th month. Yeah. So would that be nine days or 10 days? Well, it depends how you count it. So we, okay. we would take it symbolically as 10 days. Okay. Because you're just gonna count 10 days. Now, now in this case, uh, the month of Kislev had 30 days. So, so it would be 10 days if you count it cardinally. Some months have 29, some have 30. Right. Uh, Kislev had, had 30. And um, so you're going to have this 10 days. So what do 10 days represent? I'm still focused on 10 being judgment. Okay, but it's a test. Right. So the other thing that happened on December 25th, 2021 was Colin's study. Correct? Right. So Colin presents a study, and Stephen has some insight that he he has. And are these two things are what are testing this movement right now? Definitely. So so maybe instead of saying that we're at the first day of the tenth month, we're we're in this 
testing period prior to the first day of the 10th month because the divorcing happens um, on January 12th is when the divorcing begins, the day after Colin's prediction fails. Now, remember, Colin didn't predict January 11th as the end of that 65 days. He's going to use them symbolically. But he's going to start on November 8th, right, yeah, this year, saying that there's going to be this overwhelming um, victory for the Republicans that's going to lead to putting Trump into office, and that's going to lead to the Sunday law. And we know that that's not correct. But we also have something else, and that was Stephen's study dealing with the confirmation that our methods of study were correct. So we have these two things standing in opposition. So, so yeah. In, in, in the way that you're approaching this right now. Yeah. Uh, we are given the call for the, the men of Judah and Benjamin in Ezra 10, 9. Correct? Yeah. So when we come to Ezra 10, 10, which is a doubling, but is a double test. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Mm -hmm. So since we're dealing with this as a doubling, as a double test, can we then apply it to this where you have Collins and Stevens revelations as being the double test? Right. And, and the thing is, Collins' study is not, it's not, it's not completely wrong because it is light that's come to this movement, but it's interpreted incorrectly. Because we don't have an understanding of our lines correctly, we think that we need to have Trump become president again to fulfill his role, but we fail to understand the typical line. So we have this test. Now you see, I just put up on the screen here, um, and what you see in this top right hand corner is the main. Oops, there we go. Uh, why is it? Oh, I see. I'm doing that wrong. There we go. So I'm just going to show this up here. So this is the story of the book of Ezra. There is going to be these uh, 20th day of the ninth month, Kislev 20, and you're going to have these um, this period of time that's going to go to uh, the first day of the 10th month, Tevet. And then you're going to have these three months, which this divorcing happens. There's going to be 10 days in here from the 20th day to the first day. And then we, we also have the entire year of Ezra represented because the divorce ends on the first day of the first month. And that's going to be April 5th, 2030. And that's 2,640 days, a symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month or July 18th. And this is 88 days. So it's, 88 months. So if I take 88 months of 30 days, that's how I get the 2,640 days. And so this, it's this period of time with the end of Colin's prediction that we then enter into this divorcement. And so being divorced from the strange wives, I mean, this must have to do more than just with this movement. This okay. must have to do with Adventism with those that are searching for truth. Okay, Dwight. Okay. But if we if we go to Ezra 10 1 and interrelate this to what we were just looking at within judgment, within the book of Judges. Ezra 10 1 says, and when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, 
for the people wept very sore. Now, this weeping here is not like the weeping for Tammuz that we see revealed in Ezekiel 8. Is this in Ezra not a weeping for repentance? Correct. So is Samson's wife weeping because she's looking to repent of her decision to marry him? Okay, so you're saying that uh, Samson's wife is, yeah. is, um, is sad because she's marrying Samson? She decided to marry Samson. She's not happy about it? That she is repenting of her decision to marry him. Yes. Yeah, okay. I can accept that. Now, when you're repenting of something, you want to stop doing it, right? Mm -hmm. you, rec you are recognizing that what you have been doing has not been right, and you want, you want that to end. So here she is in the seven days of the wedding feast, weeping throughout and deciding that she is repenting of her decision to marry Samson. Now, Samson also repents of his decision to marry her. Right. So you have these two tests. One on her. The woman, the one that is not the church of God. And the other that is the representative of God's people, Samson. And so this divorce has to occur. Correct. Um, so here, there, there definitely we can say this is analogous with the story of Samson. I mean, the three days bring us to it, but it's also being married to foreign wives. So we've applied this in the past of this being analogous to a to the acceptance of the improper methods of study. Mm -hmm. Do we make that same application in the story of Samson? Yes. Samson has become infatuated with a false method, method of study. Okay, now, is this clear to everybody else? Are you able to track with what we're talking about? I don't see the woman sort of trying, you no know, repenting that she married something. Now she has, she is now in a difficult situation. She's been threatened with death, so that could be an aspect. But uh, I think she's just sort of uh, putting the crying on, just to harass him to try to get this information to save her life, rather than to particularly divorce with Samson. Yeah, well, and I, I would agree with Stephen there, um, except that it does represent it symbolically. But I mean, in the practical practical sense of what she's doing, I mean, she's just um, giving him a hard time. You don't love me, et cetera, et cetera. But, but in a symbolic sense, it does represent uh, this type of repentance. And she does get married to someone else. So... So does that, that make sense, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, I'm not kind of, it just didn't occur to me to see it that way before. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's not a true repentance in in that sense, but but definitely she's already has her heart somewhere else. I mean, she's having sexual relations with uh, these Philistines, so so she's committing adultery, um, and so and, and Samson realizes this. Well, her heart is definitely more with her people than it is with her husband. So, so in this in this situation, I mean, I, I, I I'm just looking at it from a different from a different aspect because as we have been very aware in order to understand a particular passage we need to bring all of the passages that relate to what we're studying together so when we are talking about samson's wife weeping we need to look at the other aspects of those when they are weeping. I could not apply this with the, the situation that happened at Baal Peor. Because the nation of Israel, along with Moses, along with the leadership, were weeping before, between the porch and the altar for the sins of Israel for what had just occurred with the Midianites. Here is a wife that is weeping at her wedding, what's supposed to be a very joyous time. She is weeping for the entire seven days and is being very clear. I mean, she is she wants her husband to reveal this to her and Samson's withholding this from her. She wants him to surrender to her the meaning of the riddle. She wants him in agreement with her. So she wants her desire in this situation fulfilled. She doesn't care why her husband is doing this. She just wants him to submit to her. So Samson chooses to submit to that which is not of God. And then his riddle is revealed. So this becomes a message more about control and submission. Are God's people supposed to submit to the world. No, in, in a sense, in Adventist history, you could liken this to what happened um, with the evangelicals. I liken it to everything that's been occurring since 1863. Yeah. So the, the church has been uh, manipulated by or Samson's just like Samson was manipulated by this woman desiring to be married to this woman, which was the, the world's churches. But this happens in this movement as well. And is this not what we're seeing occurring right now? 
Definitely. I mean, when, when we look at the two things that this movement recognizes, both sides of this movement, is that righteousness by faith is important and so is medical missionary work. But you have to have the correct method, message of righteousness by faith and you have to have the true medical missionary work. And I think it was a great mistake to bring in someone who's not of this movement um, in regarding the medical missionary work, you know, to present new age ideas of medical missionary work. Are you speaking of the, of, of those uh, sessions that were presented for two and a half hours by the, uh, the American side? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't think that's wise. I mean, we have the councils in the spirit of prophecy. And, and we also know that somebody who doesn't accept this message cannot pro properly be a good source of information. But even within this movement, and this is the thing, as I've said this many times, Jeff has fought against these two aspects, the false medical missionary work that has tried to come into this movement and the false message of righteousness by faith that has tried to come into this movement. He's always had to fight against those two elements. And, and the reason is because they're very important points. But see, th this, is, this is the other situation right now. Because Elder Jeff is not standing up there to battle against this, we have those that are more than willing to accept this to come into the movement. They don't have the perspective to stand up against this. They don't have the backbone to stand up against it. Now that's that's my opinion. I'm not saying that's anybody else's opinion. It is mine alone. But when these things are being presented, just as Mrs. White was saying on other errors that were coming into the church, what was her counsel? Was it not to meet it? Well, yes. And this is what Jeff has always been doing. He's always recognized these false messages. And and he's warned us about them. But yet, you know, we haven't listened. Many have not listened. Okay. Now, what else do we need to address? What else should we address at this point? Well, just at, at the end of this, um, right, he's going to slay these 30 men. And, and he's going to give this change of garments unto them that, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. But Samson wife, Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. So I don't know if that's like the best man got him or something. That's what I would be taking. Yeah. So, so Samson has made a mistake. Well, his wife, his wife has wept publicly before all of those that were in the wedding party. She is choosing to express her displeasure publicly. 
Samson finally caves. Can we look at this very specifically as being what occurred between 1955 and 1957 that led to the publishment of questions on doctrine, the abomination that came to the church? Mm -hmm. Why do you say Samson made a mistake? Well, Samson should have had the backbone to not have told his wife the riddle. And also he shouldn't have, have chosen her as a wife in the first place. Most uh, definitely. But if, but if you look at uh, verse four, it was of, it was of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, was that, what does that mean that something's of God? I would say it's more that God allowed it. Yeah, God allows things that will, um, in the end, lead to his will being accomplished. But it doesn't mean that it was God's uh, choice in that sense. It does not mean that it was. I don't know. I don't know that, but that'd be just like saying July 18th was a mistake. No, no, it wouldn't be the same as saying July 18th is a mistake. Because July 18th wasn't a mistake. But what what this compromise with the false methods of study is a mistake. Because he's going to seek union with someone that is not of God's people. That is wrong. But yet God oversees this and he has a purpose in it. And also here. Um, so As when, in both. Yeah. And when we read verse four, remember, Dwight, you said, but his father and mother knew not it was of the Lord that he sought occasion against the Philistines. And that is the Lord sought occasion against the Philistines. Correct. correct? That is correct. Yeah. So God has allowed this because this is the way in which God is going to, he's going to use Samson, who he is, but in the end, he's going to uh, conquer the Philistines. Right. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So we know that this is the case with this church. It's also the case with this movement. God is allowing us to go through a process so that we can be corrected. So God allows things to happen so that we can be corrected. I think the same of July 18th. Okay. Okay, explain yourself then. Because we truly don't know why July 18th was, because it hasn't happened, but it's it will be explained in its time. Yeah, but we couldn't say July 18th is a mistake because we have God gave us July. I don't 18th. say it's a mistake, and I don't say this is a mistake either. Well, this is a mistake. This has to be a mistake to to make a union against God's direct command with this wife that is uncircumcised? I think there was a purpose. God had a purpose behind it. Yeah, well, God did have a pur purpose behind it, but that doesn't mean that it was correct in what he did. I understand what you're saying. You could say we were, we were wrong to time set and that God just used our time setting because he wanted to correct us. But the thing is that how we came to that conclusion of July 18th was not through a false method of study, right? So you can't compare taking a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines, which is representative of a marriage to a false method of study, to a pagan religion. You can't compare that to the July 18th prediction. You could compare it. Uh, to what Parminder and Tess were doing, 
and you could compare it to how people have uh, um, continued to make predictions using a false method of study. But July 18th itself, it, it would be like saying that um, um, October 22nd, 1844, nothing happened. So it was, it was just God had a purpose in it, but it wasn't directly of God. So, so if we're going to take that this is, is a direct commandment, about taking about um, fellowship with those that are pagan. Um, you you can't compare July eighteenth. At least I can't. I mean, I, and I understand what you're saying, but I, I just don't see that uh, July eighteenth would even fit in the timeline that we have. So what we would have to say is it would be a test between two different methods of study. And the question is, how are we going to study God's word? Are we going to study it correctly using Miller's rules, or are we going to be following the example of the Christian churches around us? <clears throat> Any thoughts on that, Rosanna? No. Okay. Okay. We are past our time for study for today. Are there any other comments or thoughts at this moment? Well, we need to close with prayer. So no more comments or thoughts. Okay. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have been able to spend together today. We ask, Father, for your further guidance as we consider the items that we have studied, as we have brought line upon line together. Help us now so that that which we have studied, that which we have considered, we may be able to consider further through this day. Direct us so that those with whom we come in contact may see you and may see your character. Give us strength to this end. Bless our efforts to more perfectly represent your character. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.